All right. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, plus beau. thank you, Mona. Wait, pour des, wait pour a thank you very much for braving the after lunch panel, which is always a challenge. Um, there's a lot to talk about, unfortunately. Um, someone who was Pico. on our panel, who was acting director of policy planning, has had to be called away. Je n'entends rien. We, we can't hear can a thing. You can't hear? No, we, we can't could, hear. Put on the headsets then. Oh, the other ones. I mean, these. Yeah, put these on oh, because these, these ones? because then you can hear me and each other through the headset. Really interesting. Um, anyway. I regret Mr. Al Naidi couldn't be here, but we have a, a lot to talk about. We're in the Middle East, after all, so it's only appropriate we have at least one real panel on the region. Uh, there's so much to talk about, the impact of Russia's return to the region, China's Belt and Road, the notion of U.S. retrenchment, whether it's real or not, intensified regional competition. Uh, what does it mean for these countries to have a green, carbon-free world? Let alone wars in Libya, Syria, Yemen, big regional powers playing in the region, uh, the repositioning of Israel, to put it mildly, in the Abraham Accords, and what public response has been. Uh, heightened tensions with Iran, the moribund state of the JCPOA, though no one dares to actually take its pulse and call it dead, because that would mean they'd have to decide what to do next, which they don't want to do. Uh, we have problems with Turkey, which is very much engaged now, uh, making geopolitical forays. Then there's the quite interesting question of the return of Bibi Netanyahu in, at the head of a very different Israeli government. What does this new coalition mean for Israel, for the Palestinians, for Israel's reputation, frankly? Then there's the question of the health of Abu Mazen, um, what happens to the Palestinian Authority. Uh, there's always the sad tragedy of Lebanon, the influence of Hezbollah, the worry about another Lebanon-Israeli war, but with rockets, big, big rockets. And then we also have divisions in Europe toward the region. Um, so we have we're going to try, since we started late, to um, end this on time at 15.45. And without one panelist, maybe we can get there. I'll try to have some time for questions at the end. But the idea was, um, because the topic is so broad and our panel is so diverse, wonderfully diverse, to ask people to speak for a few minutes about the topics I've mentioned that interest them, and I may then ask them a question or two, and then we'll go down. So, Mehmet Karakulugu, who was, I've mispronounced terribly, <laughs> no, 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 um, that's fine. who, as you might tell, is a Turk, and he's the founding board member of Global Relations Forum and a founding partner of Kanunum, and also chairman of Koran consulting. So, Mahmoud, Thank you. over to you. Thank you. Actually, I'm a Turk, probably with an Egyptian name. Memduh is very Egyptian, as I understand. <laughs> uh, it's good to be here. It's uh, great to be in Abu Dhabi. Great to be, uh, again, a guest of the World Policy Conference. So, I thank the organizers, Thierry, uh, and, of course, Abu Dhabi for hosting us. When I'm invited, whenever I'm invited to speak on a Middle East panel, I feel both anxiety and intrigue. Anxiety because my usual life during the year, I focus on issues like digital currencies, the global energy situation, so more the geoeconomics part of the world or geotechnology. Uh, 
So Middle East, I don't have prepared remarks. I have prepared remarks for so many things, but not for this one. So that's the anxiety. And maybe in, that's better. Maybe that is better. That is the intrigue. The intrigue is that I know so much happens in this part of the world that when I t sort of take a distance and look at the region for a full year, very unusual patterns emerge, and then I'm intrigued. It's just, it induces dopamine, the expectation that I will get something interesting at the end of it. I think I'm the only one from my panel of last year, and we ended last year, I was here again on the Middle East panel, uh, saying that there is something in the air. There is something good in the air. Uh, that there is, the tensions are receding, and there is a sense of de-escalation. That proved to be, I think, reasonably accurate. This year, I mean, we did get the main tensions, quite a few of the main tensions sort of calmed down, uh, Turkey being at the center of quite a few of them, the Turkey UAE, the Turkey Saudi, Turkey Egypt, then within GCC, the Qatari Saudi. I mean, many of these tensions that burdened us seem to have softened at least. And that was the expectation. So I think we got that right. And there is a truce in Yemen, however tenuous. The Libya situation is, you know, again tenuous, but at least we're not in an active war situation. The Syria situation is complicated, but still, it is what I may call still a sort of a frozen state of affairs, not a sort of a, a war, a real, real war. So uh, this year, my concerns are really, looking forward, are related to the Iranian situation, and to the situation in Iraq and Lebanon. But uh, let me go back this, to the synopsis of this, there, was, there is something in the air. I think it was accurate, but it was incomplete. Because what I didn't realize at the time is that the something good in the air was predicated on uh, pragmatism on the side of many of these actors. It wasn't wise long-termism, but it was simple pragmatism. And what, it, what turns out to be the case, after looking at this past year, I think actually it was hyper-pragmatism. That is what we are facing. It is unanchored pragmatism. And that worries me, because I think that kind of pragmatism is ineffective to deal with long-term issues, it corrodes institutions, and it makes us unable to deal with these long-term challenges. Before I explain myself, let me just give you the punchline, because this year, before, more than before, I felt Thierry wants us to be precise, concise, open, get to the point, so let me get to the point. Get to the point. I'll, I'll tell you what the point is. Well, I think, I mean, now we are at a stage where Middle Eastern players, including my country, including Saudi, including GCC, we, we, these countries feel empowered for different reasons, and it is, these countries are in a hyper-pragmatic state. Short-termism, swift maneuvers, deals, bargains, they are the currency of the moment. It is normal for the West, but especially for Europe, to feel it's being left out of this game. But I think fast-paced bargaining is not the European forte or the comparative advantage. So I think this is a phase, and we'll need the European institutions and long-term structures to survive the phase that we are going through. I think that Europe should not compromise what it's good at. We'll need those norms, and it should use those structures in this phase to bring in the Middle East players to the table for long-term problems. Now, that is the punchline. That is my main okay. theme. Shall I stop there, or do you want me to? A couple more minutes. couple of more minutes. But Briefly where I stand, yes, we are in a phase of transitions. This is when we need foreseeability to coordinate actions when everything is changing. But instead, we get anxiety across the actors. Everybody is uh, trying to, it's, it's a it's climate of mistrust, knee-jerk pragmatism is everywhere. And norms, balances, alliances that give some structure to this world are eroding before our eyes. So it's a world of nighty and uncertainty that we see. And I think we can see it, I mean, I can't go into it, but I won't. The global energy markets is a very good example of that because I think the main axes of that structure have been broken and everybody is after self-sufficiency, which makes that whole structure very inefficient. 
reaction. What can you do when all this happens? You can go for Cartesian rationality. I think that's what uh, uh, Thierry was hinting at. I don't think it's possible. You can push someone to absorb all the risk. That's America not happening. You can have by insurance, you can say, I'll give you security guarantees. You give me energy stability. That is not working. You can have portfolio of com countries you work with, Russia, China, US. That is happening. And finally, you can just go for incrementalism, fast maneuvering, and that, I think, is the name of the Great. game. Okay? So, I mean, let me ask you a much more specific question. Please. You have Erdogan, yes. who's going to have an election soon, who yes. seems very shaken by this prospect. Uh, he is balancing <clears throat> all, all many, many powers. <clears throat> he is annoying a lot of people. NATO, America, Russia too. He's playing footsie with Russia, he's not doing sanctions. Um, can he keep going like this with a tanking economy? Or is he gonna start another war in northern Syria or with Greece? What do you think? No, Just I, on breath. I mean, very simply, no, there will not, I do not think Erdogan or Turkey will start a war. I think these problems in Syria and in Greece, they are actually manageable with under this hyper pragmatism that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. They are not, they, they can be contained within that framework. Mm -hmm. Erdogan has enough uh, room for maneuver with all the actors and all the instruments he has that we can get uh, security on our southern border. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what it is with Greece. That's a Right. You know, unnecessary right. problem. I think these can be managed without a war. Okay. Do you think he will allow himself to lose the election? Well, it's a democratic system. It's an election. Uh, so okay. if he loses, That's he fine. loses. I, okay. yeah. You know, okay. on verra, as they say in France. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. Next, uh, old friend Gilles Capel, who, as I think you all know, a very distinguished scholar of this region, of Islam, of what's going on in the banlieue of France, in the very complicated world of um, French relations with Islam. Uh, Gilles is, I'll read this, director of the Middle East Mediterranean Chair of the École Normale Supérieure, professor at Paris Sciences and Lettres, and has worked sometimes as an envoy for various presidents, including Jupiter, Monsieur Macron, Gilles. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I'm, uh, I know that uh, had uh, the results of the soccer game uh, been different last night, I would not be here. And uh, my, uh, had uh, Kyle prevailed on Killian, it would be my English opposite number who would be here in my stead. <laughs> so I try to do my best. Uh, uh, the. Um, one thing which uh, strikes me uh, in our conference is that it took us panel number 19 or 20 to discuss with the Middle East issue. As if uh, the prevailing, uh, the, the present war between uh, Russia and Ukraine was just a reenactment of some sort of East-West war of old. It is to an extent, but it is not. And uh, as you, uh, uh, Mamdouh, as you, uh, sorry, I pronounce it the Egyptian way. Yes. Uh, the, uh, uh, as you rightly mentioned, um, uh, the Black Sea, uh, <laughs> this, this war takes place on the Black Sea. And the Black Sea is part of the Mediterranean system. And, uh, but you know, this is not the first time uh, a war that was taking place in Europe also had a very significant extension in the East, whether it be uh, Salonique during uh, World War I, where my great-grandfather was a gendarme militaire, or uh, uh, Valentine's Day 1945, uh, which uh, where uh, uh, FDR and Ibn Saud had their amour toujours uh, conversation, my oil against your protection, my protection against your oil. So uh, to a large extent, uh, we have to take the region into much more serious consideration than I think we we did until, until recently. And it's not only because of oil, because of oil prices have skyrocketed, because 
the reason m many of us came here, we have to say that frankly to uh, Thierry, is that the climate is much better because we are freezing in Paris at zero degrees tonight, and we, this morning we, many of us went to the beach. Uh, and uh, it's definitely, this is a very important issue, which goes back then to the St. Valentine, Valentine, Valentine's Day agreements. But um, there is also a very significant issue that we have not taken into consideration to a large extent, that uh, as we, we mentioned, uh, Turkey, fortunately, which I believe is an extremely important actor with what you call hyper-pragmatism, which is a concept I will use and, of course, quote you in the future, where that means Erdogan changing sides every other day for in the t so that he will, thinks he will be re-elected. Uh, uh, but uh, this means also that uh, he uh, bought S-400s from uh, uh, Russia, sold Bayraktar drones to, to Ukraine, uh, that the Iranians are helping uh, the Russians with their own drones, and that uh, nice guy Mr. Menbedev warned the Israelis, if ever you give the Ukrainians the means to down the Iranian drones, beware uh, about uh, the Syrian skies, and so on and so forth. So I think that this is not something we have really uh, thought of uh, that the, uh, uh, the Middle East, uh, the global Middle East, uh, is also taken into uh, something which, now as you had hyper-pragmatism, which was your concept, let me try mine, which is disaffiliation, does that mean anything in English? Uh, that, uh, that means that you know nothing has to be taken for certain it would be hyper-pragmatism at the global scale. scale so. And uh, like, you know, uh, you mentioned the, the mission I did as special envoy to President Macron in some of the uh, southern and eastern countries of the Mediterranean, and uh, what, I was, uh, what I was being told by my interlocutors was that uh, we do not think we're bound significantly by any former alliance. If Israel brings the, be the, brings the best missiles, China the best uh, whatever, uh, Russia this and that, we're going to choose, we're going to do a sort of cherry picking, which is okay if you think that uh, the world is uh, based on daily transactional things, but uh, this uh, may lead uh, to uh, not hyper-pragmatism, but hyper-tribalism, if I may say so, and then in, so in a region where you have to have strong security. Uh, this is a major challenge that we are, we, we, we are facing uh, now, particularly in, uh, in a country like, uh, like the UAE, who's, uh, which is extremely dependent on security issues, which is part and parcel of the, of the not the Valentine's Day Agreement, but the, uh, the Abraham uh, Accord, or the, the Donald Accord, as he wanted it to be called. Uh, and. Uh, uh, particularly with what is happening uh, in Iran. One other thing which we have to take into, into consideration is that, you know, authoritarian uh, regimes uh, are also being shaken in the process. What is happening in Iran, uh, irrelevant, uh, regardless of what happens with GCPAA, no GCPOA, post GCPOA, and so on and so forth, is now... Uh, being significant, significantly different from whatever happened in the past. The Green Revolution, or whatever it was called, where you, the police and, um, arrested a number of people, sentenced them, put them in jail, and then it was put down. This is not happening. Yesterday, uh, they sentenced to death and executed uh, the first demonstrator as an uh, Adu Allah, uh, enemy of God waging war against God, which is even worse. Uh, but this is definitely not uh, bringing any quiet. Uh, this is something much deeper that has to do with uh, issues of, um, of uh, identity, of self, of uh, uh, women cutting their hair in public, something which has, which has to do with, uh, with the button, uh, with the what is intimate in, in Shia culture, and they're clearly at, at pains finding a way to changing. And we have to foresee uh, the fact that uh, the uh, Iranian leadership, in spite of the fact that they 
they have this sort of hyper uh, activity militarily on their borders are in a state which is now significantly weakened and we have to think of that for the yes. future i mean uh, br br uh, very okay. briefly uh, another issue is that uh, what is happening in in russia also the fact that uh, they uh, they are unable to 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 lead a, a military strategy which is uh, winning except bombing civilians uh, will also uh, change a number of things in the region. Uh, a number of countries were willing to buy Russian weaponry. Uh, what is happening now is not a great uh, showcasing for uh, Russian weaponry. So all that is, is changing. And I think that we, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a real need to, to interject much more of what happens on the southeastern front in this war uh for fear not to really understand the stakes uh which we deal with yeah which is why i sort of started a bit by at least mentioning russia's movement into the region which you know isn't brand new but is real and isn't going away and i'm curious you know others may want to respond to this too but what this does to russia's intentions in Syria, other places. Um, but I also am, you know, very interested, you know, seeing the demonstrations in Iran. I mean, I covered the Iran revolution. I'd still try to follow it. Uh, the demonstrations in China, which are really in interesting. We don't see a lot of demonstrations in Russia, I, ha I have to say, because perhaps many of the people who would demonstrate have already left. But I do wonder what this, this shakiness in Iran and persistent rumors that Ayatollah Khamenei is quite ill, how that will impact the rest of the region and also what Iran sponsors, which is the thing we haven't really talked about. What do you think? Well, on uh, Khamenei's uh, health bulletin, I have no answer. No. Uh, but uh, what is interesting uh, in, in Russia also is that, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the mass of people who are sent to the front are increasingly yes. people from uh, the Muslim Republic or non-Russians from the Federation, not to mention uh, the uh, famous or infamous uh, Ramzan uh, Kadyrov, who Kadyrov, re yeah. repatriated recently to Chechnya uh, the, uh, the body of uh, Abdullah Anzarov, who uh, beheaded uh, uh, Samuel Paty in France and made him a hero of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Chechnya. But the, um, uh, this is going to, there is, a, there is a price that is going to have to be paid for that by, uh, by, by Putin, relying on those populations so that uh, because they are they're, you know, citizens of a different nature, and this is this is going to probably lead to a problem within the state of the union. But others here are much more uh, uh, competent than I am on this on this issue. Now, on 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 Syria, uh, I heard the Mamdour uh, say that he thought nothing would happen uh, from the Turkish side, whereas you know we had the drum beats all over the year, and uh, was it? Uh, uh, your Minister of Defense or Interior, whatever, say it's going to start tomorrow. Where we're going to wipe uh, um, the, the Turkish terrorists mm -hmm. out of everything. We're going to have our 30-kilometer deep buffer state, mm -hmm. but uh, nothing has happened. And um, even in your hyper-pragmatism concept, which I like, don't you think that at the end of the day? If you, as we say in French, you cry to the wolf and the wolf does not come, finally, you don't fear uh, the big bad wolf anymore. Well, exactly. It's that famous Kavafi poem, the barbarians are coming, but they never arrive. So what must we do now? We have, <laughs> they were a kind of answer. You have to, we have to say that it is Kavafi, the poet, and not Kazafi, as many <laughs> no, people exactly. are talking um, Can I take that? Uh, let's... Okay. Let's let's keep going. Sorry, just sure. thinking of time. I apologize. Mona, um, long friend of this conference, uh, senator from Egypt, 
advisor to the UN High Representative for the Alliance of <coughs> Civilizations, which let's hope works. Um, and so um, I think a lot about <coughs> Egypt, although well, we haven't had many demonstrations in Egypt, despite LCC also. Um, and one wonders, say what you like, but is Egypt losing its, its important place in the Arab world? Is this a big issue at home? You are making it a big issue. Okay, you, no answers. Okay. Yeah. Say no. But before I talk, <laughs> okay. I want to thank I want to thank Thierry for gathering us once more as a very special club here, club of WPC. And I want to thank his his team. I want to thank Juan for everything they've done and of course the host country. Now let me go to the new Middle East, as I had told you. This is what I would like to talk about. The first time this term, New Middle East, was used, was used by Shimon Peres, if you remember, in 1993, after the Oslo Accords. This was a view that he has put out, uh, and an initiative, and I'm afraid it didn't work as we thought it would. Qu'est-ce qui arrive? Vas-y, parle, on t'entend très bien. Je parle Oui, oui. OK. Uh, <coughs> so... Calme, calme. Uh, at the time, many analysts uh, concluded that complete and final conflict resolution must be achieved. And here we're <coughs> talking, of course, about the Palestinian question, which was not mentioned and is not mentioned either today, prior to efforts at reconciliation. Now, I think that Simon Perez was a man of vision and that his ideas did not take hold is not his fault. But today, the move is to replace all these misconceptions in the Arab world, and there is a tendency to do so. This is what they want to do. Uh, although I have seen some commentators lament that the, Arab, uh, that the Abraham Accord represent the obliteration of the Palestinian cause and the imperialist uh, economic aims of Israel. I believe this is nonsense. That is why I think it is time today to turn to the Arab and Middle Eastern civil society, what we call, or what Joseph Nye called, the soft power. And this is where you really feel the pulse of the Arab world and of uh, the, the Middle East, the MENA region. So, I believe that after, and, and what the West thinks of the changes that are happening in the Middle East. So, after reducing the region, the region was reduced to global war on terror. For two decades, we heard nothing but that. This is what is their, uh, their claim to fame. But today, the Middle East is now seen through the lens of the great power competition narrative. Increasingly, the Middle East is defined as a battleground between the US and China, and to a lesser extent, Russia. So, what is new is the trend towards Middle Eastern strategic autonomy, which mainly translates in that the diversification of foreign policies by US Gulf partners and allies such as Egypt and even Israel, since 2021, most Middle East countries have worked towards de-escalation. De-escalation and partly out of the realization that U.S. disengagement, which I think this is a turning point in the Middle East, and um, I would think this was uh, also the flashpoint, really, the disengagement of the U.S not positive, but negative, but taken very seriously by the countries in the region, seeing that they can't count anymore on the U.S. partner. Uh, <clears throat> so the disengagement of the U.S. from the region implied that countries in this region had to take matters in their own hand. And this is what they're trying to do now. So, after the Gulf states and Egypt put an end to the Qatar blockade in January 21, a frenzy of diplomatic visits followed, and that momentum to, uh, of de-escalation even involved Iran at one point, 
with Riyadh and Abu Dhabi toning down their hawkish rhetoric towards Iran. Uh, this de-escalation moment coincided with the Abraham Accords and the subsequent wave of normalization between Israel and several Arab states. More than anything, the, <coughs> the Accords reflect the new foreign policy ambitions of Middle Eastern countries. In March, and this is important, Israel hosted a security summit in the Negev attended by Bahrain, Emirati, and Egyptian foreign ministers. The summit illustrates how much the Middle East landscape has changed in less than two years. Notably, these developments are homegrown. The, the, they came from inside the region and not from outside. They're evidence of the growing desire of the Middle East states to shape their own regional uh, order in their own terms. And the question is, what is the best way for the U.S. to tamp down the Middle East from becoming a focal point of competition with Russia and China? I believe the more local actors grow confident about their own autonomy, the less tempted they will be to align themselves on the agenda of another external power. And this is shown in the uh, Ukraine-Russian um, uh, war, when the feeling is that some of the Western countries would like our countries to take sides. And they're not taking sides. They refuse to take sides today. They are not pro-Russian, but they're not anti-Russia either. So, we heard this from Minister Girgash, eager to diversify their partnership. On the part of the West, more realism is required. So I would like to present some of the salient points that I would, that would see as prominent in the changed Middle East. One is the role of religion in daily life. Two is the role, the advancement of women in the workplace. Th three is prioritizing opportunities for young people to learn technological skills. No more are they going, <coughs> are they pushed to learn political science or international relations. And this is the only thing that I know. <laughs> so now they're pushed to stock new technology, technology uh, so as to be better equipped to participate in the 21st century. What is noticeable also is an enhanced role of the state. Today, China's uh, model is looked upon with admiration in many of the Arab countries today, in many of the Arab Middle Eastern countries. Uh, <clears throat> Non-interference non in other affairs, namely supporting each other's internal measures, be they authoritarian or not, to safeguard what is very important today in this region, which is stability. Stability and prosperity. So, uh, the belief is that jobs, economic growth and oil wealth can be used to entice citizens to ignore demands of political pluralism, which the, the West continues to ask for. Right. So, strained relations of late between the West and traditional allies in the region are bringing a central question into a sharp focus. Does the West really understand today's changed Middle East? What we're seeing today is that the leadership of the Middle East and the majority of its people have remained resolute to make progress on many fronts. But are these transformative changes being recognized in the West? I don't think so. Most of the public opinion suggests no. People in the West still tend to view the Middle East as backward and conflict-ridden, a region where progress is doubtful, and a place more likely to be a source of problems rather than solutions. That's great. No. Two minutes. Uh, 30 One seconds. minute. Thir 30 seconds. <laughs> it's been eight minutes already. So. One glaring example is the declaration of U.S. disengagement from the region. This is really a turning point here, and, but it's underpinning change in the new Middle East. What do we see? Bold reform agendas such as Saudi Arabia's modernization program. Even the veil for women is no more obligatory. So, in Egypt, if we take uh, an example, for a majority are rejecting the ideology of politicized religious move. 
although Islamist extremism is still very well entrenched in most institutions of the society, but the youth are today favoring pragmatic governments that can create more jobs for young people, reform religious institutions, and enhance public services such as health and education. Great, Mona, really, thank you very, very much. Shukranaktir. Let's move on. We can always come back to these issues. Okay. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful to you. Thank you. Uh, Itamar Rabinovich uh, was Israel's negotiator with Syria, among many of his other accomplishments. He was ambassador to the United States, which was not a bad accomplishment either. Uh, he's been a teacher, head of Tel Aviv University. He's vice chairman of the Institute for of National Security Studies in, in Tel Aviv, among many other things. Um, and um, Itamar, you've been here many, many times. Uh, Israel has a new government, but a new set of relationships here. So over to you, please. Uh, thank you. I will begin uh, with the new Israeli government and then uh, talk more broadly about the region. Um, two years ago was a very, very, very optimistic time in Arab-Israeli relations. The Abraham Accords were signed. It was seen as a, a milestone. Uh, uh, secondly, in Israel for the first time, uh, an Arab party and Muslim Brotherhood, the softer version of the Muslim Brotherhood joined the coalition, first time that an Arab party in Israel was part of a government coalition, and it seems that uh, Arab-Israeli relations were looking up. Nowadays, the uh, uh, perspective is, uh, is far darker. Um, the Abraham Accords uh, are, are there. Uh, they did not develop into a larger regional uh, structure. Uh, the summit of the Negev was mentioned. People, some, some, some people thought that this would be the core of a Sunni-Israeli coalition against uh, Iran and its uh, Shiite axis. It doesn't seem to be the case. The Abraham Accords are limited to actually very positive development in bilateral relations with uh, the Emir uh, Emirates, with Bahrain, and with Morocco, Sudan is not so important in this context, but it's not the nucleus of any regional uh, structure. In Israel itself, uh, a good government that represented the gamut of Israeli politics all the way from the left uh, to moderate uh, right, and including an Arab party, collapsed after a year and a half, and the, uh, not just the right wing, but the extreme right wing won the last elections. Uh, and it's probably going to form a very nationalistic government with probably negative implications for Israeli politics, Israeli society, Arab-Jewish relations inside Israel, and Israeli-Arab relations, Israeli-Palestinian relations in, in general. Um, it is important to bear in mind that the elections were decided by very few votes. Actually, there was a plurality for the center-left bloc in the popular vote, but Netanyahu is, uh, is a very good uh, uh, politician, election strategist. He put the right wing together in a very cohesive way. They did not lose a single vote. Center-left lost quite a few votes, and the result is that we have this uh, far-reaching change in Israeli politics. Will it hold? I doubt it. I think that this government is likely to implode. The policies that the extreme, uh, the two extremist right-wing parties and the ultra-orthodox parties are trying to impose on the country will uh, lead either to implosion or to massive popular pro protest. I doubt that this will remain the case uh, for very long, but we are in, uh, I think, for a difficult year in uh, Israeli politics, Israeli-Arab relations inside Israel and the Israeli-Palestinian problem in a broader way. Now, uh, let's remember one thing. Netanyahu is on trial. He's being tried for serious criminal charges, corruption, a breach of faith. And what interests him the most 
is his own uh, legal situation. Uh, he depends on, uh, uh, on these partners in order to be in power. He remembers that when uh, Prime Minister Olmert left the government, he went to jail. He doesn't want to go to jail. And uh, he wants to be in control and he wants to reshape uh, the legal system. This is what drives him in, uh, in the first place. Let me now move bro more broadly to the region, and I would use the word flux. I think the region is in flux on all three levels of politics, domestic, regional, and international. Domestic, we have six failed states in, in the region. Other countries on the eve of elections, as in, in Turkey, in thermal, like uh, Iran, and, and so forth. Regionally, there is no structure. There used to be a structure. The last time we had a structure, was uh, during the Syrian civil war and the Arab Spring when people spoke about uh, the Saudi axis of Sunni states versus the Iranian axis. This is no longer true, there is no axis. What is very significant in regional politics is that uh, the region has been joined by two large powerful states, Iran and Turkey. They were not part of Middle Eastern politics uh, most of the uh, previous century. Only after the Iranian Revolution of 79 did Iran join Middle Eastern politics, and Turkey, with the first years of this century, when Erdogan realized that Turkey was not going to be accepted into the European Union, and he was looking for influence elsewhere, what is known as neo-Ottomanism. So we have two countries of about 100 million people with strong economies, highly developed civil societies, a strong militaries that uh, uh, punch at their weight in, in the region. What is more recent and very interesting is that these two countries are now trying to play a larger global role. Turkey has been active all the way from Azerbaijan to, to Libya, in East Africa, in Yemen, and Iran now, of course, joined uh, Russia very closely and became part of, of the war in, in Ukraine. So this is not something that we were used to. We were used to larger international powers coming to the Middle East to control the Middle East. Suddenly we see Middle Eastern countries trying to play a larger role. One point, uh, you asked Mona about where is Egypt. I think there's been a shift in the Arab world from the traditional centers of Arab nationalism in Egypt, in Iraq and Syria. Egypt is sort of... Uh, unto itself, Iraq and Syria are in basically two failed states. And I think the, f the focus is shifting to this part of the Arab world, in, in the Gulf, where you have stable, wealthy, uh, highly developed countries that are now playing a much more important role in the, uh, in the, larger, uh, in the larger Arab world. Uh, internationally, uh, Russia is, uh, we'll have to see what the implications of its uh, uh, of the war in Ukraine for its position in, in Syria and its ability to be effectively active in the Middle East. And the U.S. always raises the uh, familiar question is, is the U.S. pivoting away or is it not? In fact, number of U.S. troops in the region has not, has not declined, but the message is, is, not, uh, uh, is, not, is not very clear. And the U.S. has, I think, a hard time of finding a solution to what Minister Gargash presented eloquently yesterday, that is to say the tendency of Middle Eastern countries to say, yes, basically we are pro-Western, but we allow ourselves sort of a polygamy that you, Washington, needs to be able to, uh, to handle, uh, uh, to yeah. live with. Yeah. Thank you. Can, can I bring you just back in, into the Israeli interior for a second, just with one question? The great experiment of the previous government, which was Israeli Arabs or Israeli Palestinians, whichever you choose to say, getting involved with an Israeli government, is that experiment over or do you think it could come back again? You know, no, it's, uh, it's, it's not over. Um, you know, the Arab minority in Israel is 20, going to up to 21, 22 percent. And Israel, uh, the majority and the minority will need to, to find a long-term way of living with, uh, uh, with one another. Now, inside the Israeli Arab minority, there are two contradictory trends. You see 
a growing middle class, a growing professional class. In my own university, Tel Aviv University, the number of Arab students rose from 4% to 16%. In the Technion in Haifa, which is Israel's MIT, it is 37% Arab students in the student population. So you see a trend of younger people moving up, uh, becoming professional, moving to li leaving their towns and going, settling in Tel Aviv and, and Haifa, and seeking integration. This is what Mahmoud Abbas and, and his participation in the coalition, in a way, represented. But there is a hard core of people who still oppose the very essence of, of the state. Um, this, this will continue. It, it needs to be addressed by an Israeli government that will come to the Arab minority and say, listen, this is a Jewish state, but you are a significant minority of 20%. We need to find a definition right. of the relationship, say cultural minority. But obviously, this is not the government yeah, of course. that will do that in Let's the coming year. That. Yeah. And of course, it would help if there finally were a settlement and two states, because then people could decide where they really belonged. But we, we don't have to get into that right now. Um, our last panelist is the distinguished founder of the Gulf Research Center, uh, Saudi Abulaziz Othman Sagar, um, who has also been a great interlocutor about the Arab world, the Saudi world, um, and I'm curious what you have to say to us since you're from the region, but I'm also very curious if you could talk a bit about relations with the United States and how they've turned. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, first, let me extend my deepest appreciation to my good friend Terry and to the World Policy Conference for all the effort they put and for the host country. I mean. Uh, this is great to see a lot of good friends and old faces together here. Uh, we understand what does it take to bring all this effort together because we are in the same. Uh, okay, let me start by saying what are the key concerns, you know, and the key pillars, in my opinion, that it is important. First, the U.S. relation to the region, and we see a softness approach, a confusing approach from the U.S. We don't know what they are up to. We have a different signal confusing signal. In one hand, they said we are reallocating of our forces. On the other hand, we are reducing our forces in the region. On the other hand, you can hear a statement by saying we remain committed to the security of the region, but what is reality, we don't know. So there is a lot of confusing signal, unpredictable coming out of Washington there that really has an impact on the geopolitics of the region. Traditionally, we understood their commitment, and traditionally we understood where does the U.S. and the rest of the West country stand when it comes to the regional security. Now, it's a bit confusing, honestly, and that confusion, you know, forces the region to take different action different play toward the other. Second, because of the confusion of the U.S. policy, when President Obama said in Syria it's a red line we will not allow, all of a sudden we have the Russian re-existent in the region. And the Russian re-existent in the region was due to the American uh, unclarity of policy. They allowed that sort of intervention to happen. Where do we stand on the Ukrainian cases? I will come into that, but I think I will pass this one because I want to focus it in the key element. The third, of course, is the Iranian expansionist. And today we are still suffering from this real serious threat you know, from Iran. We still have the maritime security issue. We still have the energy security issue threatened from uh, Iran. Interventionist policy, expansionist, using sectarianism as a dimension, supporting militia. All of those issues remain as a key um, issue for us in the region. So where does the Iranian threat go from here? That also have a very critical impact in our uh, geopolitical issue. The Ibrahim Accord. Some Arab countries, including United Arab Emirates and Bahrain, based in their own national interest, they felt going and signing into the Ibrahim Accord and normalizing relations will bring a better peace to the region. Some country in the region thought they need peace first before normalization. Some country they are negotiating quite secretly. So that is 
a, a sovereign state decision, but at the same time, this is a new element in the geopolitical side of the, of the region. Um, so the, the, the other thing, we have a conflicting uh, issues and we have a hot spot uh, in the region, including uh, war in Yemen, Syria, Libya, uh, 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 also uh, the Israeli-Iranian vessels attack in each other. Uh, so, but at the same time, that did not change the geopolitics of the region. When people talked about the Syrian crisis, they thought Jordan will be taking over next day. The, you know, but Jordan remains still there. There, Syria is still there. Uh, Turkish intervention on the north part of Syria is still there. Uh, we have the Iranian intervention in Kurdistan is still there. But that did not really change the whole geopolitical structure there. So, but that also is an important element in the geopolitics, to look at all these conflicts, all these uh, you know, issues that is taking uh, place. What is interesting also to see that the region start making their own sovereign decision without really uh, uh, waiting for the instruction coming from the uh, uh, big country, from the superpower. And I think that's a very clear signal. You can see it in UAE, in Saudi Arabia. You can see it in Egypt, in Algeria, and many countries in the Arab world start saying, look at, we need to protect our interests. We need to fight based on our interests, and we need to look at uh, that one. So this is also is an important uh, dimension. Uh, is that going to, since we are witnessing now a new Cold War era, is that independent decision and sovereign decision and so going to be challenged by the extreme two power? Well, in, in other words, our economy, 67% of our export goes to Asia. China is the largest importer from us. So in China, the president visited recently to the region. He is making a statement saying we are the second largest economy. We would like to uh, uh, legitimize our economic relation by a political visit and by a political uh, umbrella. And the U.S. is concerned, if you read today the Washington Post, there is a concern in the U.S. about the China-Gulf relation. I think it's legitimate concern, but at the same time, still it is an economic relation. It has not yet developed to a political, a strong political ties or a strategic ties. China will not replace the U.S. in the region, and China cannot provide the security that the region want or looking for at that area. So, but that also, because of the Cold War era um, uh, syndrome or uh, uh, feeling that we have, that will put a pressure in the region. Where do you go, east or west? Whom should you listen to? The, you know, each yes. one can exercise different pressure. They are a buyer uh, of, of 3.6 million barrel a day from the region. So they are, Saudi Arabia, almost 20% of their export goes to, to China. Yes. Um, also the crisis on Ukraine. We were forced by the US and to take a decision. I think there was misinterpretation of our balance. And I like yesterday when uh, Dr. Anwar Gergash, he used the word not neutral, but balance. And balance today is really having a balanced you know, position on the Ukrainian crisis. India, they have a, position, uh, a balanced position. Uh, uh, we, ha we in the Arab world have a balanced position. We, first, we are not compromising the unity of Ukraine, and that has been stated by all the four ministers. We're not accepting any intervention by using a military means. We're not accepting a, a, you know, a territorial intervention or so. But at the same time, we have a similar case in Yemen where we understand the Russian concern. And the Russian concern comes from three things. They want a friendly government to deal with. They want to have a safe border that would not represent a threat to them. And they don't want to have a foreign military presence that can represent a threat. In Yemen, we have a similar case. We want to have a friendly government that we deal with. And we, want, we don't want to have a foreign military presence from Iran in our border that threat us and, and, and represent a threat to us. And also, we want to have a safe border, you know, that sure. you know, also we share with them a huge sure. one. No. If I look at, yeah, I mean, just the last comment. Okay. If I look at the uh, 2023, I think there will be uh, a, a similar issue still of, of, you know, of concern to us. Number one, can we still keep our sovereign independency decision from the superpower? Can we really still state our position based on our interests, or that will be challenged? That's
that will be a key issue also in the 2023. Can we continue in that? Iran and what will happen to JCPOA aid? We have a different scenario today. No agreement, status quo, modified agreement with minor changes, modified agreement with the major changes. All new agreement can be reestablished and that one, we don't know. So that remains a big challenge. Sure. And how Iran is going to act in terms of representing a threat, are they going to retaliate in the region and how that is going right. to be? Well, I could ask you many, many questions, but let me just limit myself right now to, do you think the disorder in Iran makes it more dangerous for the region or does it work to keep them concentrated at home? I personally belong to Hobbes School in IR, so I believe in a central government role will be far better than having a fragmented you know, government because we saw that in Lebanon and the outcome. But also if I go back to my 2023, I think oil prices will be very important. What will happen to the oil prices? You see, because again, the region have a lot of important projects and a lot of you know, expansion and development in the uh, Tanmia, what we call development. How is that going to be? And that will play also a price. Yemen, we're almost entering the ninth year and what will happen? I think we are happy to have a settlement in Yemen, but based on two things, no intervention is from Iran in that one, based on the decision of the Yemeni people and the agreement that can take place. I think all of that really still represent you know, the sort of uh, uh, challenge, you know, to us in the region. But again, I'll go back and start from where I start. Uh, the U.S. relation is a key issue in this one here. Yes. We're not saying we need to replace it. We're not saying we have a ready alternative for that. And we are not saying we don't want it. In fact, it's a very important, very crucial. We, want, we have enjoyed almost a century of a good relation here in the region. What we want to have a more sensible approach in Washington when looking at the region here right. and respecting the yes. well, issues. Yes, great, because I mean... Thank you, sir. We've had different words for Washington. Which we need a more educated policy. We need a wiser policy. We need more attention. But clearly, the region is sending messages to Washington also, as Saudi Arabia is. The visit of Jean Zeman is a message. Yep. I mean, it's a, it's a very clear message to a very sensitive point now in Americans' view of the world. Um, I promised that I would not, even though we got started late, it's, there's a lot to do by the end of the day. So I promised to end this on the accepted time, which means I'd really like, we've got 11 minutes, that's all, but I would like to take some questions, please. Address them to, who, to whomever you like, because I would like to give the panel at least a couple minutes to, to, to respond. It's been um, a very rich conversation, but it's hard to draw a theme. So Igor, please, can, can, can we, perfect. And then after that, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. My question goes to Mr. Rabinovich. <clears throat> we were made to believe that without a Russian army, Assad is dead. No regime, no, no, no power, nothing. So what, hap what happens now when the uh, Russians' hands are full in, in, in another war? And what happens on the Turkish-Iranian confrontation there and Kur <coughs> Kurdish question? OK. Uh, um, you go to, to your right there. Okay. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks to the panelists for this, uh, these wonderful presentations. I would ha like to have a very short comment on what's happening in the Middle East today. As I, th I see it as a very contrasted situation. On the one hand, you have the Abraham Accords that have triggered such, such a tremendous change in the area, and we're witnessing uh, an unseen cooperation uh, between Israel and the, and the countries of the, area, of the region. On the other hand, we have still questions that are unsettled. May I remind you that we have the Palestinian issue, the Lebanese issue, the Syrian issue, sure. the Yemeni issue, the Iraqi issue that are, um, that are just uh, pending, if I might say. So my question would go to ask uh, the honorable panelists here, 
um, about one thing that is very much worrisome. As Mona has rightly tackled, um, pointed out too, we are witnessing the regionalization of Middle East. The intervention of the superpower or the so-called superpower is no longer here. I mean, the fading uh, presence of Russia, even of the United States, of course, the obsolete uh, maybe a role of, of Russia in the years to come. So what is very much uh, um, worrisome is the fact that in this region, we have no regional institutions that might br or may bring about a kind of settlement of all these conflicts. Right. I mean, uh, you, you have the European Union, Question. you have the ASEAN, you have the NATO, but in this region, which power, from your point of view, is the one that might be able right. to, to bring about a change or a settlement of the, in this Perfect. region? Thank, Thank you. you so much. There's, there's another question, I think, from my Japanese colleague back there. <coughs> yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Hiro Akita from Tokyo. Tokyo. My question is about the Arab uh, state's relation with Russia. I understand that the uh, Arab state uh, have been taking a balance, balancing behavior between U uh, West and Russia. But the, my question is, as Russian uh, military situation uh, get more and more deteriorated in Ukraine, uh, will, will it affect the Arab country's distance with Russia? Uh, uh, yeah, that is okay. my question, thank you. Perfect, and last question, Jim Bitterman. Jim, stand up so they can find you. Uh, it's just a question for, for the panel in general. I mean, it seems to me there's an inherent contradiction. It's a great panel, it's a great discussion. But when you start off talking about hyper-pragmatism and move on to polygamy, um, uh, and then the desire for stability, uh, those of us in the room with a certain age have a sort of a fondness, nostalgia for NATO and for these institutions, these grand institutions that come along. So how do you square that circle? How, how is it that you can have stability by making hyper-pragmatic deals and, and uh, having multiple lovers? Thank you, it's a very good question. So listen, I'm afraid we're not gonna have tons of time, so I'm gonna go back to the panel, ask each of you to respond as you like for no more than two minutes, please. You've got the clock. Also, you can see it. So let's please keep to the time. Okay. O over to you. And right. apologies for not getting back to you sooner. Oh, that's all right. Uh, about Syria. Now, the situation in Syria, I think when and if the Russians sort of recede, uh, it, it creates a new constellation. And that constellation could work to sort of put the pieces together because there are two things, Syria's territorial integrity and not having Iran in Syria. Those two things can actually align quite a few um, uh, actors on the field. I think the US, uh, I think Turkey, what remains of Russia, Russian presence, those can be aligned. And when I talked about Turkey not engaging in a war in Syria, what I meant is that Turkey will not be, it will not be a sort of an outright war, mm -hmm. but what is very clear and consistent and continuous from the beginning it does, is that Turkey insists on the security of its southern border. Right. And so we have these sort of uh, sporadic incursions to ensure that. And what is pragmatic about Erdogan's president, Erdogan's approach, is that he waits for the timing when the stars are aligned for, to find the point of least resistance. And I think we are very close to that point of least resistance Great. because of the reasons I mentioned. That is one thing. I still have 45 seconds. And the second one <laughs> is with the hyper uh, pragmatism, I think, yes, you're absolutely right. It is very difficult to hold it together. Now that we have sort of some room for maneuver, uh, because of the oil prices, because of Turkey, because of the Ukrainian situation, creating some room for Turkey, for a while this can work. But I think in the long run it cannot. And this is a phase, and we will go back to the first search for stability. And that is why I think it is very critical that the Europeans don't feel that they're being left out of a fast bargain game. They should just sort of hold on to their guns. Their time will come. They should, we should not lose credibility in the European ability for structures. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. That was good. Gilles. 
Sorry, I mean, you speak up. Uh, well, yeah, why don't you borrow that? Perfect. Is it better? Yes. Fine. Uh, answering or tr an, an attempt to answer uh, Joe Mela's uh, question, I wonder whether what remains of um, of a lo of a regional institution, uh, the only one that remains to some extent is the GCC. And I would like, of course, I would turn to Abdelaziz for more uh, more comments. Uh, after we, everybody considered that the GCC was dead and buried uh, because of the Qatar blockade. This has ended for a number of reasons that many people, many of you know about. And um, when uh, when she came to to the region, he. Uh, he went. He came to Saudi Arabia. Uh, all the all the regional powers or non-powers gathered to Saudi Arabia, and f seen from China, the place where everybody was uh, summoned, quote unquote, or whistled to to come was was the Arabian Peninsula. So, to to a large extent, uh, the um, the sort of the uh, the financial center. Of, uh, of the region is more and more becoming its political center. And because particularly in a time when resources are scarce, where uh, the price of commodities is uh, growing, where hyperinflation is coming, uh, the position of power of this part of the, of the region is uh, significantly increasing. So that would be my gut feeling, but I'll, I'd like to have the you're not from the, the horse's mouth. I don't say you're a horse, of course, uh, <laughs> the but, uh, you know, I mean, Femme uh, al Hassan. Okay. Mona, please. I also would like to answer Joe Myla's uh, question. Uh, we do have institutions. One of them, which is the main one, which is the Arab League, is unfortunately impotent. And the only one we can look at is, again, the GCC, which we thought that it was mm, the most Dead. resembling, let's say, to the European Union. So we do hope that they will continue to do so. But what I want to say is that the main thing that exists, and nobody spoke about it so much, is the need from people of the region to have religious institutions be changed be more pragmatic, be more uh, uh, to have a, a dialogue that um, President Sisi had asked for four years ago, a reform of the religious dialogue. And this is not happening, unfortunately. And another thing is that the um, extremism, Islamist extremism, is very well entrenched in many of the uh, societal institutions in Egypt in particular. Okay. Thank you. Itamar, okay. uh, To Igor's uh, question, I think Turkey will, first of all, Turkey is practically annexed about 8% of, of Syria. It will continue to hold this territory. Let's bear in mind that Turkey is the one preventing Russia and Syria from conquering the Idlib, the province of Idlib, in which you still have 50,000 jihadis. Um, Turkey doesn't want an attack on Italy because it will send another million refugees into Turkish territory. So it will remain involved in a big way. As for the uh, Im impact of a potential reduction of Russia's presence in uh, Syria, uh, there is a very close Iranian-Russian relationship now in Syria and in Ukraine. And the, the more or the, the greater the decline of Russian presence and influence in Syria, the greater that of, of Iran. The difference is that Russia wants influence in Syria, Iran wants to penetrate Syria, to, to turn the, the country in a very deep and a very profound way. Briefly to Jim Bitterman's uh, question, I'm afraid I see more instability because there's another factor at work, which is population explosion. Uh, 320 million people in the Arab world today, numbers are growing, mostly in the non-rich uh, Arab countries, and this would create further instability in years to come. And they're very young. Besides. Maybe I don't need to. Uh, Abdelaziz. Okay, please. yeah, is it okay like this? Fine. Yes. Um, 
let me answer by two things. I think in January 2021, when we had the GCC summit in Al Ula, I think it was clearly stated that we resolve a lot of the dispute differences that have occurred between the Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain, and Qatar. And I'm so happy as a Gulf citizen to see the relation is back to normal, even better. The last week we've witnessed the visit of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed to uh, uh, Qatar. We have seen um, you know, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the Crown Prince, being in Qatar for the World Cup, uh, for the uh, uh, you know, uh, opening ceremony. So that's also make us feel what brings us together more than the different. Now, in terms of regional security, there are several initiatives, which include the US Mesa, which include the Russian. Uh, Mesa was rejected by the Iranian because they felt it was against them. The Russian was rejected by the American. Russia initiative was rejected by the American. The Iranian was rejected by the region because the Iranian initiative, although it's based in non-intervention, non-aggression, but they, want to, they don't want to ignore the past and just deal from today and on. They don't want to deal with Hezbollah, with the interventionists in Syria. And by the way, in Syria, because of the Israeli military attack on the Iranian presence in Syria, that have reduced the Iranian capability since the beginning to almost 20% today. They don't talk about it, the Israeli, neither the, the Iranian they talk about it, but it is reality on the ground. And the Russians are providing clear rules of engagement in terms of military action from the Israeli against the Iranian presence in Syria. Now, we understand from a national security point of view the, the Turkish interest in North Syria because in no way we will support a separatist group like the PKK, because we have a, also a serious situation here in the region if we do so. But we hope that will end soon and the Turk will just you know, try to finish it as fast as possible. On the, on the other initiative also, we have the Chinese now coming up with the initiative. We, you know, but still, that Chinese initiative, we're not so sure that it works. So we have the American, the Russian, the Iranian, the Chinese, and the European but the European focus on maritime security, what we need in any initiative in the region, three preconditions. Inclusiveness, so we need to include Israel, Iran, Turkey. We cannot exclude any one of these three. Second, we need to have the guarantor. First, we need, to, we, we need to resolve the current problem in the region. We can't go into a security architecture in the region and we have the... Uh, militia supported by Russia in Libya, and we have the militia in Iraq supported by the Iranians. So we need to resolve current problem in the region, and then we need to have the guarantor. And the guarantor cannot be only the UN. So we need the, the Security Council plus the UN and find the right formula of the sort of guarantor that can be provided to have a better security architecture. But by the way, look at the difference. We called the Jeddah uh, summit, which was attended by President Biden, Development and security. Here, we did not call it security with the Chinese. We called it development and sustainability. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. And if I may, just for one second, let me thank Tiali, Song Lim, the organizers, the hosts, and especially the translators who have been working their butts off and done a, such a wonderful job. So. As you applaud the panel, please applaud the translators also. <laughs> <laughs>